This is our last little section here in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, and this is uh, part number three, which I call the aftermath of uh, the Gog and Magog war uh, mentioned there in Ezekiel chapter 39. And if you look at verses 9 through 29, there's a here's a uh, There's a bedtime story that uh, Ellie uh, brings to me. Uh, I'll we'll read this at night sometimes. Uh, it's called Mercedes and the Chocolate Pilot. I don't know if you guys have seen this one before, but it's a it's a story about this uh, one uh, Air Force or uh, Army Air Force pilot back in 1948 and 49. His name was uh, Gail Halverson. And what had happened after after World War II is that this, and in this book it describes the, the Berlin Airlift. You recall that, that the Soviets had come and they had uh, surrounded the city of Berlin and they were trying to starve the people out. So what happened is that the British and the uh, United States allies came in and they, they brought in plane load after plane load for two years straight of of food and provisions for the, the citizens of Berlin since the, uh, the Soviets wouldn't let anybody come in. And one such uh, individual, his name, as I, I told you, his name was uh, Gail Halverson. And uh, one day he was standing out uh, by the end of his runway and these kids came up to him and he's like, oh, I, I, should, I should give these kids a treat. And there was a ton of them. Out there. So what he did is he well, he only had two sticks of gum. So he pulled these two sticks of gum out and he, he divided them up as much as he could with the kids and then he also gave them the wrappers and these kids were like, oh, this is amazing. And they were smelling the wrappers and they were just savoring that gum. And he said, you know what, I don't have enough for you, but here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I'm gonna fly my plane over and if you see me kind of wiggle the wings of my plane, I'm going to drop these candy bars um, uh, out, and then you'll know that it's it's uh, me. And so what they did, what he did is that he went and gathered a whole bunch of, of uh, handkerchiefs from all of his friends, and, and he uh, tied candy to it, and then as he was flying over, he saw this group of kids at the end of the runway, and he would wiggle his wings, and then he dropped all these, these candy bars with these... Uh, handkerchiefs with parachutes down to them and you see all these kids running out coming to get their their candy and, and everything and they they would call them Uncle Wiggly Wings and uh, they would uh, come in and they would just be looking for them over flying over and uh, anytime that they saw the, the these uh, wings wiggle they knew oh here comes some candy and they come running out and uh, uh, his uh, superior officer found out and he went into his office knowing that he was probably going to be like uh, court-martialed. But the guy got upset at first and he said, but I want you to keep on doing this. And so they gathered up thousands of, of uh, handkerchiefs and they, they uh, put the, all these little parachutes together. And for two years straight, he would uh, drop uh, these parachutes onto the little kids over there in Berlin. And... Uh, what had happened is that there's this one gal, her name was Mercedes, and uh, she, she dreamt of that day when she could make it over to the, to the Tempelhof Air Base and then uh, grab one of these uh, little parachutes and have candy because she's never had any um, before. And she uh, went one time and some big older boy knocked her over and took the candy and so she never had that opportunity. So. She, what she did is that she wrote a, a letter to her chocolate pilot, Uncle Wiggly Wings, Gail Haverson, and then uh, he, she said, you know what, um, I don't have any candy, and you keep flying your plane over, and you keep scaring the chickens in the yard, and I'll forgive you if you just send, send me a, a box of candy, I'll, I'll, I'll be your friend uh, from here on out. And so that really touched his heart, and what he did is that he put together this big package of chocolates and lifesavers and everything. And uh, her mother brought it home to her and her eyes were just so huge looking at this 
thing of chocolate that she had never had before and just savored that and kept this letter from, from uh, Gail Halverson for, for years. And then what, what would happen in uh, 1971 is that she had kept this letter and said, you know what, your, your uh, offerings of hope and peace kept me going all those years and uh, they had uh, kept a, a friendship uh, up until uh, Gail Halverson passed away. I think it was in 2015. Uh, but I, we read that story, um, you know, me and Ellie at, at night and uh, just uh, it talks about, you know, even though there was a, a horrific war uh, that was experienced over there in that part of the country and, and all throughout the world, um, that there comes a point where you need to do reconstruction. You need to do some building up of those that have been vanquished. A, a major part of efforts in war is not the campaign, but the ability to rebuild and construct and to, to, win, to win the hearts and the souls and the, and the minds of, of people, and to provide an environment where the mistakes of the past are not repeated again. And this uh, serves as a great example of that reconstruction, of that rebuilding that they had uh, back in the latter part of uh, the 1940s. Um, we do this through compassion. We do it through care of, of former enemies. We do this through a, 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 a rebuilding. And such is what happens here when we're continuing to dig through uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39, and, and the prophet Ezekiel describes several elements of renovation and of re restoration after the war of Gog and Magog. So you see from this past couple of weeks just the devastation that God allowed to be wrought upon uh, the, the, the invading armies of Gog and Magog as they in this future war as they come to gather and and uh, annihilate Israel to wipe them off the face of the earth God steps in and he takes them out he miraculously delivers uh, the nation of Israel now what we know uh, from scripture is that this war has not occurred yet this is one that is yet to occur this is uh, one that has, uh, has implications for the rest of uh, the end times. But what happens here, you have this massive army come in, try to take out the nation of Israel. God steps in and he obliterates them. Um, what occurs after, that's uh, what we're going to find out right here. So uh, Ezekiel 39, and let's begin here in verse uh, 9. And uh, what we find here is, is uh, interesting. Look here at verse 9. It says, those, Then those who live in the towns of Israel will go out, and they will use the weapons for fuel and burn them up, the small and large shields, the bows and arrows, the war clubs and spears. For seven years, they will use them for fuel. They will not need to gather wood from the fields or cut it from the forest because they will use the weapons for fuel. And they will plunder those who have plundered them and loot those who have looted them, declares the sovereign Lord. So there are five letter or yeah, three letter Bs that I want us to take a note of here in the text. The first one is, is a burning. From this text, it indicates that the people of Israel, they would go out and they would gather up all the weapons that were used to try to destroy the nation of Israel. It lists a lot of ancient military equipment and ancient uh, military uh, technology. So you have uh, bucklers uh, in some translation or, or body armor. Uh, you have bows and arrows. You have clubs and spears. And so they go out and they gather up all of this equipment and from this equipment, they have enough right there to provide enough uh, energy for the nation of Israel to exist for, for seven years. Now, there's a couple of things I want us to take into consideration here because um, this doesn't sound like a modern army in this text. You know, bucklers, bows and arrows, clubs. It sounds like cavemen. Kind of fighting here, but what we need to take in consideration that Ezekiel is using language that people could understand. 
Um, Warren Wearsby says if he had written about jet planes and rockets, he would have been a poor communicator. They would have no idea what he was talking about. And so it's important that Ezekiel uses the language of his time to communicate. Here's the war, and what you have here are all these weapons. And what are these weapons? So he's going to use the language of his day. So notice it also says that the collection of unused equipment that the people have right there, they collect all the, the weapons here, they will use it for fuel for seven years. Kind of sound familiar right there? Seven years? Okay, this is why I place this event at the beginning of the tribulation. This bias that, you know, you have seven years of tribulation. Why would they need to be burning or using these equipment? Is this equipment for seven years. Well, they have to survive for seven years. So I would place this event right at the beginning of the tribulation and uh, before the time of Jacob's trouble. And they're not going to have to be burning things or having fuel uh, for the millennium. That would make no sense. Uh, and we're going to talk about the millennium, uh, the event that happens after the seven years of tribulation uh, when God establishes his kingdom. We're going to be talking about that in, in about two weeks. Um, from our previous studies, we have identified Magog um, as ancient terminology for including modern day Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. Um, Ezekiel further identifies Magog as coming from the remotest parts of the north. So we have these major powers right here coming over from you know the ones that are mentioned here in chapter 38 you have persia libya uh put uh kush magog gomer meshach tubal Tagama. they come in from the north with their weapons of warfare ready to wipe out the nation of israel uh, but god steps in uh, takes out these armies what is left behind and they're trying to destroy the nation of israel is is their fuel is their is their weapons um, and obviously uh, with the the nuclear technology that uh, Iran has and the, the technology that Russia has uh, if Israel is able to procure these weapons miraculously uh, then they don't have to gather anything that would have to produce power or fuel uh, for them um, these are going to be fuels that will last them for the seven years of tribulation. It's interesting, uh, this past week, uh, I, I read an article stating that, uh, the, that Russia, you know, one of, the, one of the areas that is mentioned there in the scripture, Magog, uh, Russia this past week is uh, testing uh, one of their new missiles to deliver uh, a nuclear weapon, and they call this missile, according to NATO, they call it the Satan II. Interesting. <laughs> That's the name of their missile, the Satan II. They have the Satan I, which is their, you know, it's a cruise missile, very fast, almost undetectable, but the Satan II one, very fast, undetectable, and it has stealth technology uh, on it. And they're calling it Satan. It's just interesting uh, to me right there. But you consider the technology that is present right there in Magog, Persia, uh, in these areas, and they're going to unleash these weapons, and then God's going to miraculously deliver the nation of Israel from these weapons, and then Israel will go out and gather them uh, together. Um, so it's important to us, when we watch the news, to consider what is happening over there in nations like Iran and uh, in, in Russia, because this has implications for what may happen in, in the last days. Um, I want us to notice uh, one thing, and you know, this is my last time I'm going to show you a little clip from Prager University, but this is really important for us to understand when it comes to, um, to understanding uh, the nature of what is happening over there in Iran and concerning their nuclear ambitions. Let's take a look. Why are so many people with so many different perspectives, from the Prime Minister of Israel to the King of Saudi Arabia, so worried that Iran might build a deliverable nuclear weapon? 
Or, to put it even more simply, why do we have to stop Iran from getting the bomb? The reason is painfully obvious. They might actually use it. France has nuclear weapons. So does the United Kingdom. But nobody worries that they will use them. It's not nuclear weapons that are the problem. It's who has them and what they might do with them. We do not worship Iran, we worship Allah, said Iranian leader Ayatollah Khomeini in 1980. I say, let this land burn. I say, let this land go up in smoke, provided Islam remains triumphant in the rest of the world. A militant nation that does not fear its own destruction is a sure threat to its enemies. And that threat is taken to a whole new level if the militant nation arms itself with nuclear weapons. Who are the enemies of the Islamic Republic of Iran? There are three. The first enemy of Iran is the United States of America. A common slogan chanted by Iranians at public rallies is death to America. <coughs> but it's not just a slogan. Iran has been committing actual acts of war against what it calls the Great Satan for over three decades. There was Iran's seizure of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran in 1979, the 1983 bombing of the Marine Barracks in Beirut that killed 241 American servicemen, and the 1996 Kobar Towers bombing in Saudi Arabia that killed another 19 Americans, not to mention the war in Iraq, during which Iran did little to disguise the fact that it supplied anti-American militias with sophisticated, armor-piercing munitions responsible for the maiming and death of hundreds of U.S. soldiers. A nuclear Iran could greatly expand its efforts to harm American interests, secure in the knowledge that its possession of nuclear weapons would make any military retaliation extremely unlikely. And over time, and not much time, a nuclear Iran could develop the sort of intercontinental ballistic missiles that would bring American and European cities within range of its weapons. A second enemy of Iran, which is a Shiite Muslim nation, are the Sunni Muslim nations of the Middle East. An Iranian bomb would instantly spark a nuclear arms race in the region, as Arab states nearly all of which have majority Sunni populations, move to defend themselves against aggression from Iran. As these regimes and dictatorships race to become nuclear powers, the chances that nuclear weapons might be used, either directly or through terrorist proxies, grow exponentially. And the third and ultimate enemy of Iran is Israel. Only around a thousand miles separate the Islamic Republic from the Jewish state. Iranian leaders have called Israel a rabid dog, a cancerous tumor that needs to be cut away, and have called publicly and repeatedly for Israel's annihilation. They wage a continuous terrorist war against Israel through their proxies, Hezbollah and Hamas. Former Iranian President Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani a man often described as a moderate and a pragmatist in the Western press, articulated the Iranian position this way. If one day the Islamic world is also equipped with weapons like those that Israel possesses now, then the imperialist strategy will reach a standstill because the use of even one nuclear bomb inside Israel will destroy everything. However, one bomb will only harm the Islamic world. He's right. That's why the civilized and sensible leaders of the world cannot allow Iran to develop nuclear weapons. Because once the Iranians do, they will pose a severe threat to the security of America and Europe, spark a regional arms race that could see the world's worst players acquire the world's worst weapons, and threaten the Jews with extermination for the second time in a century. Or, to put it more simply, Iran cannot be allowed to get the bomb because they might actually use it. I'm Brett Stevens. Join Prager University. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Okay. Here's a plausible scenario. You have 
the nation of Iran building up their weapons. Okay? All of a sudden, where's the church when it's raptured? We're gone. The United States is out of the picture. That army of 100,000 militiamen over there in the nation of Iraq, that's gone. Who's standing between Israel, little old Israel, the size of it, El Salvador, between them and Iran? There's no one. They step in, try to launch this attack, according to Ezekiel 38 and 39, and then God steps in. You know, Israel is not prepared for that. All these other nations come alongside and they join in on this effort to annihilate Israel, which has been part of their agenda for, for decades, uh, for, for centuries, essentially. And then God steps in and wipes out this invading army. What is left behind is these we are these weapons, rockets, nuclear weapons, all for the intended purpose of being of taking out the nation of Israel, but these weapons are used in turn to help power and to fuel Israel for seven years. Now, I want us to notice something important here because you notice uh, on this following map that all of these areas that are in the red these are these are uh, mostly. <clears throat> Uh, these are primarily the extremist Shiite Muslims. Okay, there's red and the purple, and to some extent, these yellow areas. Now, it's interesting, I'm doing a little overlay on this, but all those areas that we've just mentioned, you know, Gomer, uh, Fut, Libya, Kush, these are all, these red areas, these are all the ones mentioned the purple, red, and yellow areas, these are all the areas that uh, are going to be involved in this Ezekiel 38 and 39 uh, war. These are mostly militant uh, Shiite Muslims. The green ones, those are the Sunni uh, Muslims. Uh, they're not as extremist, but they're not involved in this, in this war. Is this coincidence? I, I don't think so. I think that there's there's a militant branch of Islam that desires to wipe out the nation of Israel, and you see this kind of played out even uh, right there in Ezekiel's uh, prophecy. So number one is that you're going to see a burning. You're going to see a burning of the usage of the fuels of the weapons of war, and that's going to be help, used to help uh, the nation of Israel during the seven years of tribulation. The second thing that I notice here in the scripture is that you're going to see a burial, you're going to see birds, and you're going to see beasts. Right here in verses 11 through 20. Look at verse 11. It says, On that day I will give Gog a burial place in Israel, and the valley of those who travel east toward the sea. It will block the way of travelers, because Gog and all his whores will be buried there. So it will be called the valley of Haman Gog. So what you have here is that the nation of Israel will go out and... Uh, they will go and bury all of these uh, fallen soldiers uh, over there in the land of Israel. Now, there's uh, the burial place as to where this happens has not been given an absolute identification. It is identified as the Valley of Travelers. So here we have the nation of, of Israel, um, kids and junior uh, youth. What's the what's the, the lake of up top? The Sea of Galilee, good. What's the river in between? Jordan River and down south is the the Dead Sea. Good. So what you have here in the south and eastern portion, right here, right next to the Dead Sea, is what we would call the the, the Valley of Travelers. Now it's interesting to note that this Valley of Travelers is kind of in the same general area of where Sodom and Gomorrah is. Okay, so Sodom and Gomorrah, this is the Dead Sea right here. Uh, this is Sodom and Gomorrah. This is kind of generally the area that, that these seas, the cities of the plain, were, were uh, situated. Um, and so it's interesting that here in Sodom and Gomorrah, back in Genesis, this was destroyed by earthquake, by fire, by brimstone coming from heaven. Same thing happens 
to this, this uh, invading army that they're destroyed by the same thing. You know, earthquake, fire, brimstone. Um, same exact thing happens. And uh, just as a, a thing of note, you go over to the area in which Sodom and Gomorrah is today, you find these sulfur balls scattered all throughout this area and they're 90% <laughs> pure. And you don't find this anywhere on, this, on the earth. You only find this in Sodom and Gomorrah and around these sulfur balls you find burn marks around it. Kind of give you a little indication that perhaps, you know, the Bible said fire rained down from heaven. I think it did happen. There's archaeological evidence to say, oh, well, something happened there. Same thing will happen someday, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Look at verses 12 through 15. It says, For seven months the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land, and all the people of the land will bury them, and on the day I'm glorified will be a memorable day for them, declares the sovereign Lord. All the people of Israel will go out. Notice this says Israel, not just Judah, but it says Israel. If you recall, Israel was carried off into captivity uh, uh, several hundred years before, but now it says in the scripture, oh, Israel is going out to collect all these bodies, and they'll do this for seven months. Verse 14, men will be regularly employed to cleanse the land. Some will go throughout the land, and in addition to them, Others will bury those that remain on the ground. At the end of the seven months, they will begin their search. As they go through the land and one of them sees a human bone, they will set up a marker beside it until the grave diggers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. Also, a town called Hamanoah will be there, and so they will cleanse the land. So it's going to require seven months in order to bury all of the bodies that are, are there in the land. This is one of the reasons I believe that this battle happens early on in the end times uh, scenario. It will require the Jews to bury these bodies in relative peace. Uh, and that is what the first half of the tribulation is like. Uh, relatively secure, not absolutely peaceful, but this, you, know, we, you know that the second half of the tribulation is bad, the first half would require a modicum of peace for them to go out for about seven months, cleanse the land of all the bodies that are scattered around from judgment. Look at verse 17 and verses 17 through 20, what happens to all these bodies. It says, Son of man, this is what the sovereign Lord says, call out to every kind of bird and all the wild animals, assemble and come together from all around to the sacrifice I am preparing for you, the great sacrifice on the mountain of Israel. There you will eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of princes of the earth as if they were rams and lambs, goats and bulls, all of them fatted animals from Bashan. At the sacrifice I'm preparing for you, you will eat fat till you are glutted and drink blood till you are drunk. And at my table you will eat your fill of horses and riders, mighty men and soldiers of every kind declares the sovereign Lord. So, so great is this slaughter that the scavenging birds and animals uh, will go out and scavenge and they will be glutted, they will be sated on, on the flesh of these, these, uh, these invading armies. This is common language, common biblical, it's a common biblical image that is used to describe God's judgment. Isaiah uses the, the his pictures of of animals and of birds uh, for God's victory over Enoch, Jeremiah for God's victory over Egypt, and Zephaniah for the Lord's dealing with Judah. A similar invitation to the birds and beasts will be given after the campaign of Armageddon, and that's in Revelation 19, verses 17 through 21. And so you see a burial happens for seven days. You see the birds and the beasts uh, glutting themselves on the armies that try to invade the nation of Israel. But you notice this last one, and I call this building. Okay, so you have a burning, you have a burial, you have beasts, you have birds, and then lastly you have a building uh, here. And this is a reestablishment of the nation of Israel. Verse 21 
through 24, it says, I will display my glory among the nations, and all the nations will see the punishment I inflict and the hand I lay upon them. From that day forward, the house of Israel will know that I am the Lord, and the nations will know that the people of Israel went into exile for their sin because they were unfaithful to me. So I hid my face from them, handed them over to their enemies, and they all fell by the sword. I dealt with them according to their uncleanness and their offenses, and I hid my face from them. So God destroys this invading army, not only for the protection of his people, as it says right there in the, the text, but that the people of the world will also know his, of his glory. This will be a demonstration of his glory before the Gentiles. They will tell all the Gentile nations that the Jews are God's people, and yes, they were punished in the past, but now they're going to be destined for a kingdom. So it says right there, yeah, verse 23, they were unfaithful to me, and I hid my face to them, hid my face from them. They went over to their enemies. I led them to the sword, but I'm going to cleanse them of their uncleanness. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to hide uh, my face from them. And then in verse uh, 25, it talks about God's character uh, being uh, redeemed. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I will now bring Jacob back from captivity, and I will have compassion on all the people of Israel, and I will be zealous for my holy name. They will forget their shame and all the unfaithfulness they have shown toward me when they lived in safety in their land with no one to make them afraid. When I have brought them back from the nations, notice what it says right there, that God has brought them back from the nations. Okay, remember where they are in captivity? They were in Babylon. But now God is saying, I'm bringing you back from all the nations, plural, instead of singular. So God is bringing them from different areas, such as has happened in our time. When I have brought them back from the nations and have gathered them from the countries of their enemies, I will show myself holy through them in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. For though I have sent them into exile among the nations, I will gather them to their own land, not leaving any behind. Okay? I want us to note it's important that there's several things that are happening right here in this text. Let's finish it out. Um, uh, verse 29, I will no longer hide my face from them, for I will pour my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the sovereign Lord. Now, when we study these passages, it's important that we have to recognize that this has not yet been fulfilled. It hasn't happened yet. So what happens here in this text is that the nation of Israel, okay, this part has happened. The nation of Israel has to exist. The nation never existed until our time. Until 1917. There was no such thing as the nation of Israel. Until 1917 with the Balfour Declaration over there in, in England, then we had the nation of Israel. And it wasn't until our time that we have this nation in front of us. And so that's the first thing. Not until our generation do we have the nation of Israel. Secondly, the nation of Israel must be regathered from all of the nations. And it has, and it's still continuing today. Um, notice it also says in the text that none will be left behind. So we're still clearing out all of the nations of its Jews and bringing them back into the Holy Land until all of have come back to the land. And then lastly, this has not happened yet, but it says that God will pour out his spirit on his people. You know, the nation of Israel has not yet fulfilled their covenant promises by not accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior, not accepting Him as Messiah. So God is still relinquishing His Spirit, His Holy Spirit, from His people. And until they do have that relationship and come to Him in repentance and recognize Jesus as the Messiah, the Holy Spirit cannot be poured out on His people the Jews. So this hasn't yet been fulfilled. And so it's important that when we read this text, this is a war that has not happened yet, but it is yet to occur. And so we're seeing these things build up to this point where one day God will restore his people, 
His people will recognize their sin. They will repent of it. They will turn to Jesus Christ as their Messiah, as their Savior, and then he will pour out his Spirit on his people. So let's take a look. Let's wrap this up as to what potentially could occur. Could I be, could I be right? Could, could I be wrong? Yeah. Okay. But as we piece this together, we need to understand there are several elements that are occurring in our day and time that could this could be a plausible scenario in which uh, these events of chapter 38 and 39 could occur. Um, I'd be more than happy to sit down with you and discuss this a little bit further because I am not the, the repository of all of all end times knowledge, but I'd love to get into a discussion with you as to what could occur. But today, we live, and according to my understanding of what Scripture says, we live in the church age. One day, God will come, rapture His church, take His church away to be with Him forever in the rapture. At some point, at this somewhere in here, could it be before the rapture or after the rapture? I'm not sure. This is when the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39 happens. This war occurs, and then um, these nations are wiped out. A guy steps in and says, oh, well, you know what? This nation of Israel, they're on God's side. We need to sign a peace treaty with them. His name is Antichrist. Antichrist shakes, his, shakes their hand, and so Israel has relative peace for about three and a half years. At this point, halfway through the tribulation, the Antichrist desecrates the temple that will be there in Jerusalem. That sets out the Great Tribulation. There will be a great persecution that will occur in the nation of Israel to such an extent that, that so many will die. And then Jesus Christ has to step in. He returns. And then that ushers in the millennium, which we will study in about two weeks. So stay tuned. We're going to tell you a little bit more about the millennium. So you look at the program of the last days, and you see that God has to offer some amazing things. He is providing truth. He is providing justice. He is providing life and providing peace. And then you have Satan... The devil, the forces of evil, offering something contrary to that. And it looks a lot like what God has to offer. And so what I'm seeing here is a balance of what, you know, what we would call God's design in comparison to Satan's counterfeit. You know, God has a trinity. You have Father, Son, Holy Spirit over there. And Satan has a counterfeit. He also has a trinity. You have Lucifer, who said, I'm going to be like the Father. You have Antichrist, who's going to be anti-Christ, so he counterfeits the Son. You also have the false prophet, mentioned there in Revelation. We studied that a, a couple of months ago. But the false prophet mimics the, the work of the Holy Spirit, because the, you know, the Holy Spirit always points towards the Son. He always... Uh, reflects and gives glory to the Son. The same thing with the false prophet is that he will give glory and honor over to Antichrist. So you see a counterfeit of what God has designed. You see sealed believers in God's design. Then you see Satan's counterfeit, the mark of the beast. You see, you know, God's design, Christ died, the Son died on the cross. Antichrist will also be wounded as if he was dead. So at some point, Antichrist will be wounded. It says that his head will be wounded. You can look this up in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. And he will be wounded as if dead. And people will marvel and they will mourn him. And then God will... He, he resurrected Jesus Christ. But the same thing, Antichrist will be so-called resurrected as well. You can read that right there in Revelation 13, Paul Marvel, oh, he is, he's alive again, this Antichrist. And they will say, oh, he's the true Christ. And he will deceive many. God is known, Jesus is known as the Prince of Peace. Uh, Satan will give a guise of peace. God will be worshipped. Same thing with Satan, he desires worship. 
You have children of God. It says, but as many as received them to them, gave he the right to become children of God, even to them that believe on his name. You have a little relationship with Jesus Christ. You can be called a child of God. But you also have children of the devil. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. You have that contrast. Always a counterfeit of what God has designed. You have biblical Judeo-Christian values. Well, Satan has his own values. And why we call that tolerance today. Where people will do exactly what is right in their own eyes. Or they have their own morality. Everything that God has, Satan has a counterfeit. Everything that God has, Satan will try to mimic. You take a look at, at that one prayer, you recall this? One guy gave this prayer to the, the Kansas State Legislature and he said, you know, we have replaced God's design with something far different. He said, Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and seek your direction and guidance. Lord, we know your word says, woe to those who call evil good. But that's exactly what we've done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and inverted our values. We confess that we have ridiculed the absolute truth of your word, and we called it pluralism. We have worshipped other gods and called it multiculturalism. We have endorsed perversion and called it an alternative lifestyle. We have exploited the poor and called it the lottery. We have neglected the needy and called it self-preservation. We have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We have killed our unborn and called it choice. We have shot abortionists and called it justifiable. We have neglected to discipline our children and called it building esteem. We have abused power and called it political savvy. We have coveted our neighbor's possessions and called it ambition. We have polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts today. Try us and see if there be some wicked way in us. Cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Guide and bless these men and women who have been sent here by the people of Kansas who have been ordained by you to govern this great state. Grant them your wisdom to rule and may their decisions direct us to the center of your will. I ask it in the name of your Son, the living Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What he detailed there in that prayer is that we've taken God's things and settled for a counterfeit. We have used God's goodness and turned it into something that is far from it. You see all these counterfeits in this prayer? Everything that God has, Satan tries to mimic. Same with our lives right here. He'll give you a counterfeit joy saying, oh, you need this thing in your life. You need money. You need all these possessions. In order to have this joy in your life, he'll give you this counterfeit. He'll give you a counterfeit joy. He'll give you a counterfeit happiness, a counterfeit peace. How do we tell the difference between the counterfeit that Satan gives us and tr the true Joy, peace, happiness that Christ can give us. How do we go up to tell that? I believe it happens just like those people who study counterfeits in, in our nation's government. Whenever they study, find out what is a counterfeit dollar, what they do is that they study the real dollars so much and they understand the details of all these dollars so that when a counterfeit comes along the way, they say, oh, it's just natural to them. Because they have studied the true ones so much, it's easy to pick out the false one. The same thing with us. If we study God's word and we are inundated with it and we are consumed with the truth of God's word, whenever Satan comes along with something counterfeit, it almost click in our minds, oh, that's false. You know that what tells us, tells me, is that we need to be men and women of the truth. We need to be so inundated with it that when God, when Satan comes along and provides his counterfeits, it's like, oh, I know that's wrong. 
we need to be so dug into God's Word that we can pick that out almost immediately. What you put into your heart, that's what's going to come out. So here's the question for myself and for you. Are you inundated in God's Word? Are you inundated in his truth? Or are you inundating your life with something else? We've had a mixed blessing in our home. Um, we canceled cable TV. Okay? Which means we're going to have to find some alternative to watch the Broncos games here sometime soon. But I'll tell you, it's been good for us as a family. As tough as that was, was you know, and you know, it's a mixed blessing. Mid River said, you know, we're cutting out cable, and it's good actually because we've been spending more time with each other. I've been spending more time studying God's word, spending time with the family, and playing silly games and things like that. And I'm realizing more and more as I'm inundating myself. And good things, it's like, wow. <laughs> it's a mixed blessing. What I'm finding here is, and I'm not telling you to go out and cancel your TV subscription or anything like that, but I'm asking you, what are you inundating your life with? Because what you put in, that's what you get out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of what you put into your heart and life, that's what affects you. Are you inundating yourself with the truth of God's word so that you can understand, oh, this is what Satan's offering. This is a counterfeit. And I'm telling you this lesson because it's something I'm learning over and over. I'm not telling you, okay, got to get rid of this and this and this in your life. But I'm asking you, fill your heart and your life with the truth and God will abundantly bless that. And I'm learning that in some amazing and wonderful ways. Are you willing to give a little bit of sacrifice today so that you could become more intimate with your heaven, with your with a relationship with your heavenly Father, and become more compassionate with those who are around you, with and spend more time with your family? Are you willing to give up a sacrifice for the benefit of eternity rather than? right here and right now for your own pleasure and benefit right now. Give up a little something to give something even greater. Oh God. Are we men and women of the truth? Are we inundating ourselves with that today? Let's pray. Lord, I pray that we would not settle for the counterfeits of this earth. And or that we would we would seek you in truth and in, in a desire to get to know you better. Lord, you have called us all to, to follow you with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength. And so, Lord, I pray that you will do this in very practical ways, Lord, that you will help us to, to draw close to you in all things. Thank you, dear God, for these these great truths and these lessons, I pray that you will apply it to our hearts and lives all throughout this week. Thank you for this great group of people that have gathered today, together today. Would you dismiss us with your blessing, with your love, and uh, to you, Lord, we commend all these things. We pray this in the precious and holy and awesome name of Jesus. All God's people said. Amen. Amen. Hey.